please welcome Ramesh and Partha for MIPI High Speed Technologies Debug and Conformance Testing. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. So I and Partha have been associated with the MIPI Forum for over a decade. And today in this session, so we are going to discuss about the, some of the challenges that we faced while working with the MIPI, MIPI Alliance for developing that specification as well as that uh, compliance test solutions. So if you look at it, so for the, for the past decade, so we have been associated with the MIPI Alliance. We have been kind of you know, contributed for both data for d and c and the m serial interface technologies. So before we begin with a kind of little overview about that D5 signal characteristic. We know that D5 signal is a kind of, you know, that two types of transmission. So one is called the low power and the low speed, and the other is a high speed transmission. We know in D5, so that it has got a data lane as well as the clock lane, and, and when, when it takes the Data, when you want to transmit that high speed data, it takes the transition from low power mode to that high speed mode. That's named it called the LPHS transition. Okay, when it takes the transition from LPHS, there are many things that happens because it goes through the state, something like LP011 and LP01 and LP00 state, and then settle down on that high speed transmission over here. So, but since uh, the MUPI, uh, D5 is a kind of, you know, FEC mechanism that's called a forward clocking mechanism, so both clock as well as the data will take the transition from LP to HS concurrently. So, when you want to do the kind of, you know, signal integrity measurement for the D5, so we have to acquire the kind of, you know, all the four signals called DP, DN, and CP, and CN simultaneously, and then do all the signal integrity for those signals. Then, if you, if you look at it, as a kind of, you know, the D5 is evolved, so initially it was about 800 Mbps, then now it's kind of, we're talking about in terms of 2.5 gigabits per second. And that new measurements that have been added in the D5 is a kind of, you know, that I diagram and digital measurements that have been added, so in the latest, latest specifications. The key challenges for the, key challenges for that uh, D5 is about both the TX and the RX are connected together. We have to acquire the signal when it is transmitting a signal and the receiver is responding to the signal. If you look at all the D5, the specification, the specification has been defined to add the pin output of the chip. So that means we should be able to kind of, you know, that, uh, that the, uh, we should be able to access the signal or we should be able to acquire the signal at the pins of those chipset. In order to acquire that, it is important that, you know, that uh, so the prop should have a necessary extender or an accessories so that we can hook up directly to the chipset. If you look at it over here, the kind of, you know, this is a very high bandwidth prop, so because it goes up to kind of, you know, that 13 gigahertz, but we come out to the kind of the PC flex channel so that you can directly solder to the pins of those chips. Wherever that is, it's not possible to take the prop to the close proximity like this, so then we can take to the other way so where we can make use that kind of the point contact prop so that we can acquire the signal from the chip directly. As we know in D5, so when you take that LPHS transition, so the termination, so because of, so generally in D5, when it is in ideal state, it will be in kind of, you know, the low power state. That means uh, no current is flowing through that transmission line. So when it takes the kind of an LP to HS transition, the termination impedance of the receiver changes from kind of high input impedance to 50 ohms. It's important that the kind of another prop should be able to tolerate those kind of a termination change when we are acquiring the signal. So it's also important that the props and the props accessories are very important because that will take you to uh, closer, to, uh, that'll take you to prop the signal closer to the pins of those steps. If you look at it, in D5, for the compliance measurement, when you want to do only the TX alone, then you can use that kind of an you know, RX is a kind of a termination board. And then we try to prop very close to that kind of you know, the signal that's coming in over here. There are different sets of you know, accessories available with the prop, and the prop with a kind of a lead resistor, which offers a kind of you know, good eye input impedance without affecting the signal integrity, have been designed. 
if you look at it, some of the extended that will come out is that kind of, you know, that this is a four inch and a two inch and one inch and then kind of you no know, wires at all over there. So, but it's also important to consider these kind of in prop back accessories or extenders coupled with the prop will affect the bandwidth of the whole systems. So that's what we are seeing here. Hey, where, when you can use the kind of a long lead, so because the data rate is slow and the rise time of 227 picoseconds is good enough, okay, use the long lead. But we have the different varieties over here, so you can go up to the kind of you know, 52 picoseconds over here. Then, apart from the prom and the accessories, it's very important to consider that input impedance offered by the prom. So generally, so the, all the props are kind of, you know, either the differential or a single end, that's what we use when you want to acquire the signal. But we know that uh, the D5 is a, a kind of low power is operating in a high impedance state. When it is to turn that uh, kind of transition to that high speed, it's terminated to 50 ohms. So that means the impedance is changing on the transmission line. So we have no other goal, so we have to use that high input impedance differential prop. So when you say high input but differential props, so people generally talk about the DC. At DC, the most of the prop offers very high input impedance of 100K. But as the signal speed increases, then the impedance offered by the prop decreases over here. During the early days, if you look at it, so the kind of, you know, that at five or six megahertz, so that prop impedance is reduced to kind of, you know, 300 ohms. But later on, so kind of, you know, envisage that, that when you envisage this requirement, and got into the product line, then design the prop that offers very high input impedance up to kind of, you know, that one, up to kind of, you know, 800 ohms at one gigahertz. If you look at the picture on the right hand side, so that blue waveform is occurred with that low impedance, whereas the yellow waveform is occurred with high impedance. You can see, you very clearly see that kind of, you know, transitions of the high speed over there. So bad. So we, which affects the kind of you know, probe, most of the probe input impedance is that the input capacitance of the probe is affect the impedance of the probe. We know in D5 is very sensitive, so what is that kind of another you know, capacitance? They offer the capacitance of receiver from three picofarad all the way up to 20 picofarad. So it's important when you probe the transmission line, my probe capacitance is as low as possible, it should not affect the signal integrity. So in the end, we do it while after developing the kind of, you know, the set of the compliance mission, this is one of the things I would like to share it with you is that, so we don't leave, once we develop the compliance mission, we don't leave it as it is because we take all the field inputs and continue to improve our measurements. So this is one of the measurements. So we developed the compliance test solution, but you know that the people comes back and say, this is one of the measurements called the slew rate measurement. It is applicable for the low power speed, low LP speed. So how do the slew rate is measured is that we use the sliding window of 50 millivolts and then slide through the kind of during the rise and fall transition between the 15% and the 85% level of the DC level signal. As we slide through the 50 millivolts, then we observe the slew rate variation is something like this, but you know that it's going to cross the limit at some point of time. So we observe that randomly certain slew rate is crossing the limit. As far as the compliance is concerned, if the slew rate exceeds that kind of you know, 150 millivolt per nanosecond, we call that as a fail. Then the customer comes back and say, hey, what's happening? Then it's a kind of an part that's analyzed for about a kind of you know, three to four weeks of so what's going on over here. Then we observe that the slew rate variations is happening because of due to the oversampling and then due, because of non-monotonous of that during the rise or fall transition and the noise coupled on the signal. Then later on, the kind of we devise a method, something like, you know, that, okay, if we apply the kind of, you know, the band limit filters, so then the, all the transition will be the monotonous, and then the slew rate kind of, you know, will give the consistent measurements over here. So then that has been observed in the compliance specification that's been put over here as use the kind of, you know, 400 megahertz bezel Thompson filter while performing this measurement. If you look at it as a kind of a D5, it takes the transitions from the kind of, you know, that's a 1.1 to 2.0. So then we, then the new measurement that has been added in D5 is a I diagram. If you look at the I diagram, so, so in that I diagram, so is previous defined for the kind of bitter rate of 1e power minus 12. So, but as we know that, because we need a larger amount of populations of the UI in order to test that 1e power minus 12, then, come out with the idea of a kind of, you know, prorated mass. That means the mask has been elongated for 1e power minus. If you have the population 1e power minus 6, okay, the mask has been elongated 
for 1 e power minus x. But some customers would like to test, hey, how does the kind of, you know, that uh, my eye diagrams looks like if I have the population correspond to 1 e power minus, how does it look like for 1 e power minus 12? So that's what we did over here is that, so some of the measurements, if you look at it here, the inner envelope is com corresponds to each BAR. The, the innermost one is a kind of, you know, 1 e power minus 12. That means this eye diagram is going to degrade up to this point for 1 e power minus 12. And each BAR you can kind of, you know, visualize it here. So, so far we discussed about the D5. You know, the C5 is a completely a transition for us. Because uh, we used to work on uh, non-returnable to zero and the differential signal. But C5 is entirely a different paradigm altogether. It's a three wire, three state, three different state signals, right? So that in the out of three wires, the two wires will take the voltage transition in opposite direction, whereas the third wire will take the transition to the mid-level. So the kind of, uh, kind of the transition and the voltage transition and the level ensures that, so there will be a kind of, you know, the clock boundary is available for the each symbol in C5. So not all the learnings of my NRZ technology can be applicable on the C5. It is something different. different. Here, if you look at it, thing is that, so out of three wires, three differential signals have been derived here. Look at it. So then, uh, out of the, these three differential signals, we can take the rise time and fall time by default because it takes the level from kind of, you know, that strong zero to strong, uh, strong zero to strong one or strong zero to kind of weak zero, strong zero to weak one. It has a different, like, take can take the different levels. So when it takes a different level, the rise time and fall time may not be same for all the transition. That means the slow rate is not same for all the transition. Apart from that, so it has a three differential signal and then only one clock. So we have to recover the clock from three differential signal and then do the eye diagram measurement for this, for, the, uh, for this technologies. So that means we'll have to test the three, it'll have to generate the three eye diagrams overlapping each other or individually made available using a single clock. If you look at it, um, here, the eye diagram is also not the regular one because nowhere we use the triggered eye diagram. So in C5 is the technology where we use the triggered eye diagram. If you look at the triggered eye diagram, what does it mean is that, so that the clock has been recovered, so by considering all three differential signals, whichever the signal has a zero crossover, the earliest crossover has been locked as a clock. And, and that all the other transitions relevant to that trigger will be placed over here. Then we call, this is a, called the triggered eye diagram. Okay, so after doing the clock recovery, the things on the right hand side, if you look at it, so that's a kind of another clock. Okay, so the clock, the jitter is, uh, the clock jitter is distributed uniformly over here, whereas the data jitter is not uniform because, so once the trigger eye diagram is there, so then, then the, all these things is, uh, represent that based on the levels, so it can kind of, you know, close the eye or move away from that so then, so if you look at the clock jitter, so not all the clock jitter will be transformed into kind of another you know, data jitter over here. So the increment of uh, what, 10 picosecond of a clock jitter will introduce about 30 picosecond on the data jitter. That is because if you look at it, that the signal takes that kind of three different levels of the transitions. If you look at it over here, so that's due to that unit interval variation. If you look at it, here, there are three differential signals. So one is called A, B, B, C, and C, A. If you look at it, if I lock onto the clock over here on the green signal, so then the unit interval is available from here to the next one is the red signal is emitted zero crossover over here. Then wherever is the kind of in a close proximity here, if you look at it, so that's called the double transition. And the red color one is called the single transition. And if you look at it, both red, green, and blue take the transition together, that's called the triple transition. So there is a delta time between that double transition or the triple transition. So that, that delta time is going to vary so based on the level, levels of, based on the levels of the transition. So then when the delta, trans, delta time is more, that is going to influence the minimum unit uh, interval availability over here. If you look at it as the delta transitions of the minimum and maximum is about 700 picosecond, that has influenced that kind of, you know, that 
So you have single transient unit interval goes down from 400 picosecond to 340 picoseconds. Okay. So this is the normal signal. Okay. Oh, what happens? Okay. So if you look at it, um, if you look at it, so that's a normal signal. Suppose if we had a stress to the signal, what happens to that those delta time? When we add more stress to the signal, so then what happens? Like a kind of an ISI and the JITA. So if you look at it, so the delta T of time for the two successive transition goes up to a maximum of 178 picosecond and 150 picosecond respectively for double and triple transition. Okay. So that then that has a di direct impact on the minimum UI availability. So that is some kind of, you know, that 400 picosecond is the minimum UI is a 260 picosecond. In case of single transition and double transition is about 323 picoseconds. If you look at it, so while developing the stress to I diagram, so then we come across that issue, so okay, so, so when we stress it more, because during the early days of a C5, the, the mask width is about 0.4 UI, so that means a 0.6 UI you can have a jitter. Okay, so when you're developing it, so when I'm developing the clock recovery algorithm for this, I have assumption was kind of, in any two successive clock edge, when any two successive clock edge is about Point, uh, about greater than the 0.5 unit interval, so then I lock it as a clock. So when you come to the clock recovery of it, so initially we made an assumption that any two successive edges has more than 0.5, I can lock it as a clock. Once I lock it, so then you can see that here I'm missing the clock. So that is due to the kind of you know, delta T of the either double or triple transitions over here. So then what happens, we went back and then worked on our clock recovery algorithms. So then if you look at the jitter number over here, it is peaking up to kind of, you know, the 800 picoseconds here. That means I'm missing the sum of the clock transitions in this when the ISA is added. Then we went back and then worked on that kind of, you know, the clock recovery algorithms. And then, so what we do is that, so we have to track that next clock edge correspond to the locked clock edge rather than the kind of, you know, that, uh, Company, the time difference between the two clock edge should be greater than 0.5 UI. So that's a modification we made on the clock recovery algorithm after the die diagram. So it looks like even for the stress die signals. Okay. So these are some of the challenges that we faced. So while developing that, while contributing to that DFI and the CFI and the M5 technologies. Now I'll hand over because uh, to my colleague Parthan. So because who is actively involved about generating a signal, stress the signal for the receiver test. Okay. Hey, thanks, Ramesh. Hey, thanks, Pratham. So just to make up for the lost time, I'll be quick here. Uh, first, uh, let's try to provide an overview of uh, the receiver testing, where, where based, on the, based on the test, right, you generate an appropriate stimulus and then feed it to the receiver of the device for testing. And then by some mechanism, you try to ascertain whether the uh, receiver has, the reception was error free. Usually in the case of DeFi and CFI, the, um, the designs have bit error detectors. So uh, we can use that to check, uh, to check the quality of the recep reception. Next, we can talk about some of the requirements for receiver testing of uh, C5 and D5. Uh, it is true, in general, that the receiver testing is more involved than the transmitter testing. And a uh, few of the questions are, how complex or how simple the test setup is? Or how easy is it to configure uh, or generate various kind of test scenarios? Um, and how easily you are able to control the various parameters. Uh, these are very pertinent questions for a receiver test setup, uh, more so for C5 and uh, D5 receiver testing. Uh, the C5 uh, CTS has about 20 different RX tests, and D5 has about 30 different RX tests. And uh, the test setup should have the capability to support for the signal generation of various different conditions for, to test those. So just to mention a few, uh, especially in the case of C5, uh, we would need a waveform synthesis module 
which addresses the three wire, three, uh, three level signal case. And also it, has a, it uses a special encoding scheme, so we would, have, we would need to have a generator to, gen, uh, to perform the similar encoding from bits to symbols to wire states. Um, so the, the topic of switching jitter, which we, uh, which we spoke about previously, is I think it's a very important metric uh, for the generators. Um, because this is an inherent, uh, inherent jitter due to the nature of the signaling, this is an important metric for the waveform generators. So uh, on the figure, uh, you see a burst waveform for both D5 and C5. It's a composite waveform having both the LP region and the HS uh, portion. As you can notice, there are a bunch of uh, timing parameters uh, mentioned here. So as you can imagine, the test setup you have should, have should not only have the flexibility to control all these parameters, but the range of these parameters and the precision with which you can generate also matters. Uh, more often than not, we have received requests. Uh, some of the designers would, would have the need to, uh, to have the flexibility to not just uh, have the configurations allowed by the spec, but they want a wider range so that which are crucial for while trying to test for margins and also uh, to evolve the spec to future versions. So this is one particular specific topic uh, related to duty cycle distortion um, uh, where we had a lot of discussion within the work group while we were uh, mm, drafting the first version of the CTS for C5. Uh, so usually we are aware that all, most of the high-speed serial standards uses sinusoidal jitter as a way to stress the receiver to test for um, jitter tolerance. So given the nature of the C5 clock recovery where the uh, trigger point, the trigger point is actually uh, is computed for every symbol based on the three differential waveforms. So the system is actually inherent, inherently immune to the SJ. So we were on the lookout for other ways to stress the receiver, and uh, duty cycle distortion was a candidate. Then there was a the next uh, little bit of confusion uh, uh, in terms of the definition of DCD. We all know the definition of DCD is well defined for the NRZ case. Uh, for the C5 case, it led into slightly different interpretations uh, initially. So the, the, uh, the picture on the right side is trying to define the DCD for a three-wire uh, signal where the delta or the duty cycle change is constant for a given symbol for all the three, three lines A, B, and C. And also that there are multiple ways to uh, synthesize a DCD. One of them is to uh, uh, de-skew the lines A, B, and C, or more traditional way of uh, by changing the duty cycle. Three minutes on the clock. Um, so the current uh, version of uh, D5, which is version 2.1, goes up to 4.5 gig. The current version of C5, which is version 1.2, goes up to about three giga symbols per second. So. Um, as the spec evolves and there are uh, ongoing discussions that uh, the future specs could almost uh, have more than double the rate, rate which we have today. So in those scenarios, it is inevitable to have uh, uh, the link analysis capability in our test system where you may want to embed a compliance channel for TX testing or maybe de-embed de -embed a trace or the fixture for calibration purposes and maybe even to just mimic the receiver CTLE or DFE um, uh, equalizers from the receiver. Uh, and I, I think uh, with that, we have come to the end of this presentation. Uh, just a quick summary was we were, we were trying to highlight some of the various scenarios or to give a flavor of the various issues we kind of encountered during the process of spec and CTS development. One of them was the key switching jitter, 
which uh, led to an introduction of a new spec parameter in the, city, uh, in the spec right, to make the design more reliable. The second one was the case of uh, LP uh, slew rate me measurement where you saw where the test uh, procedure itself was so susceptible to noise, so it had to be uh, taken one more revision. And the third case was trying to evolve the de uh, definition of the NRZ DCD to C5 and to have a stress for, um, for the C5. I think uh, with that, we, can, uh, we come to the end of the presentation. I think we can open it for questions here, Roy, at this stage. Any questions for Partha or Ramesh? No questions? All right then, Partha, thank you. Yeah, just Ramesh, wanted to add, uh, add that uh, there are quite a few members from Tektronix here uh, today, all, all day long. Just in case you want to engage in offline discussions, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, speak to them. And uh, for, uh, last but not the least, I want to th thank Roy, uh, MIPI Alliance, uh, Laura. Uh, appreciate the opportunity for having us uh, to speak today here. Thank you.